So it's my pleasure today to introduce Professor Barabasi from Northeastern University and Harvard. Um, he's currently a distinguished professor uh, at Northeastern and director for its Complex Network Research Center. Um, he started his career at IBM and the University of Notre Dame, where he was named M.U. T. Hoffman Professor of Physics uh, at the age of 32. Um, you're in a real treat uh, today. Um, Professor Barabasi is one of the most highly cited researcher in all of science, I would say probably on Earth. <laughs> um, so he has multiple papers having thousands of citations, and I was quite amazed to see when I was Googling him to found that he has one of his 1999 seminal papers was cited 15,000 times, uh, according to Google. Um, that was quite amazing. So he, he has been a major contributor to the development of network, network science. And, um, st and also the statistical, statistical physics of complex systems. Um, and he has made nan landmark contributions to the study of biological networks, especially protein-protein interactions and metabolic networks. Um, for example, uh, he and his colleagues have shown that the scale-free property of networks exists in biology. Um, and more recently, he's been turning his attention to diseases, um, especially network medicine, and, and he also co coined this new term called disease Diseases, so zoom. One of those ohms that you hear a lot about these days, basically. Um, so, where in which uh, diseases are connected uh, um, in this network if they share a significant number of uh, genes. Um, so, and I, I also look at his website, and he has a large number of diverse and interesting projects going on. And with all of those, it seems like he still can find time to write books. So, he has authored several popular science books for the general audience, including a bestseller named Link. So I urge you to check it out. Um, so without more delays, I just want to welcome Professor Barabasi. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for coming. And uh, it's a pleasure to be back. Uh, I, we just figured out yesterday and today that I was in this room six years ago in the same capacity. And let us, not hope, let us hope that we will not repeat that experience because during the talk twice, the alarm went off and we all had to leave. Then came back for another five minutes, we started again and so on. So hopefully we're gonna have a smoother ride this time. Uh, so what I really wanna talk, as the title uh, indicates, is about network medicine. And in particular, networks and medicine and how they really come together. And the best way to start is to use a simple analogy, which is, the analogy of a broken car. You know, a broken car in many ways with a smoke on engine and dysfunctional lights has many similarities to a human with a disease. But there is one huge difference between a broken car and a human having some disease. It's virtually guaranteed that if you take the car to the mechanic, he or she will be able to fix it. And that's not something that we can say about many of our diseases. So the question is really, how is it possible that a mechanic with far less education and far less income than a medical doctor can actually achieve perfection when it comes to fixing your car in most of the cases, yet we struggle to, uh, to uh, fix many of our diseases? And of course, there are multiple reasons for this difference. And of course, this is a law, you know, like a law ball that I'm throwing here. And, and one of the reasons, of course, the mechanic can fix the car is because it has the pieces. It has the spare parts. And not only it has the spare parts, but it knows exactly what are the parts. And if you think about it, that is about where we are in medicine too. So that may not be such a major difference because what the genome project provided us is really the parts. We know the genes, we know the proteins, we know the metabolites. We know what are the components or the architectural components of ourselves. The other thing that the mechanic has that the, that the medical doctor does not, however, is the wiring diagram, the blueprint of the car. That is, how are the different components wired together? How do they interact with each other? Where do the different pieces fit? And in many ways, what I would like to argue today about is this is what the, what the secret of medicine has to be, is to understand this wiring diagram to understand how the components fit together, because down the line, I view that diseases really correspond to the breakdown of a region of the network, of a disease module that we're about to define, and we will not be able to map out those disease modules unless we have a good understanding of a network as a whole. Now, the question, of course, is that whenever we look at some of these diagrams, and I'm sure many of you have seen of the networks within the cell, 
the first thing that strikes us is the complexity of the wiring diagram. How messy it is, how, how you know, unpredictable, how random it looks. And indeed, if we want to kind of characterize, we do need quantitative tools to make sense of these many interactions between the myriads of components within the cell. And some of the tools that really help us to uh, speak about these networks and some of the earlier models really assume that these networks are truly random. Indeed, some of the earliest models from the 1960s by Paul Erdős and Alfred Rini assume that if you want to model a complicated network like the one that you see in the cell, you need to assume that with a certain probability, randomly, uh, uh, the net nodes are connected to each other. And this is why I'm showing you the process. I'm picking randomly pairs of nodes and linking them together. And as I'm increasing the number of links, you start seeing pathways that you would recognize as pathways. If I add more links, then some of these pathways will link up with each other. And eventually, if I add a sufficient number of links, and this was actually one of the major discoveries in the 1960s, then almost phase transition like a network will emerge in the system. And what has happened since the 1960s till today is that mathematicians have really gone great length to characterize this random network, this object that you get by randomly connecting the nodes together. And there are lots of predictions that come out from this work. I would like to focus on one in particular, which is what we call the degree distribution. So this is Paul Erdős and Alfred Rinn, the two mathematicians who are really have done some of the most fundamental work in the area of random networks. And what you see on the left-hand side is an example of such a random network. And the question is, how do we characterize this network? And one way to do it is to simply look at the degree of a node. The degree of, a, this, degree of this node is two because it has two links. This one has degree four and so on. If you have a very, very large network like that, randomly connected, different nodes would have different degrees. And the best way to characterize it is to look at what we call the degree distribution, simply counting how many nodes have one, how many nodes have 10 and 100 links. And one of the things that Erdős and Rényi have showed, and some of his <laughs> students later on, is that the, the, this degree distribution follows what we call a Poisson function. What does it mean to have a Poisson function here? It means that the vast majority of the nodes have roughly the same number of links, and it's rare to very rare to find very highly connected nodes or not so connected nodes. So effectively, hops, highly connected nodes are absent from such a random network. Now, one of the questions that may come up in this context is not whether this model is correct or not, or whether this prediction is correct or not. These predictions are actually proven exactly. But whether do we really believe that networks that we see in nature, from the network within the cell to social networks, are really random? Because if we were to assume that the society were to be random, that the nodes would be us and the links would correspond to whom do we know, who are our friends, who are our acquaintances, then in a random universe, most of us would have approximately the same number of friends and would, they would not see outliers, very popular individuals, or no one that actually without a, a substantial number of friends. So do we really believe that real networks like the society are random? And to answer that question, we really need to start looking at real networks that we, that we can explicitly map out so that we can gu be guided by experimental data. And that's what we did about a decade ago, where we started focusing on the World Wide Web, whose name says it's a web, it's a network. Notes are documents, links are the URLs. And the reason we focused on that is because it was, a map it was mappable. We could write a robot, which is a piece of software, that would allow us to, fix, to figure out where does one web page link to, and then where do the other pages link to, and so on, and eventually return a map like that of the underlying network. Now, the question that comes up is that, how should this network look like? And there's lots of randomness in the way we put the links on our web page, because the links we put on our web page follow our interest. And even in this very room, there is quite diverse interest. Some people care about molecular biology, others care about you know, music, and yet, yet others may care about sumo wrestling. So effectively, the links you put on your web page follow your interest, given the diversity of the interest, you would expect that this network to an outside observer may look random. If this were to be random, you would see a Poisson degree distribution, yet the data showed us something different. This showed us, showed us something that we call a power law distribution, which is the probability that the node has scalings goes like k to the minus two. Now, the question you may ask, so what? I mean, do, you know, why is this exciting to have a different function that we expect? It may excite the mathematician or the physicist, but does it have any meaning? And it turns out that it does. And let me first give you like a visual understanding 
of how different is a random network, like the one uh, that uh, the Shandini built, from the one that we see over here. Well, a random network visually looks a bit like the highway system of US, where the cities are the nodes and the links are the highways connecting them, because this is a relatively uniform network, not truly random, because it's what we call a planner network technically. But you don't find any city with 300 highways going in and out, and you don't find any major city with no major highway connecting it to the rest of the highway system. So it would be a very big distribution and decays very fast afterwards. The type of network we found on the World Wide Web would be much more like the airline network of US or Europe, where the cities are the major, or the nodes are the major airports and the links are the direct flights between them. And you can see the major difference between them. Here now we have a few major hubs that hold the whole network together. And that's exactly what the power law distribution tells us, is that we have many, many small degree nodes and a few very, very highly connected nodes or hubs that hold the whole network together. Now, you may find that this is interesting that in the World Wide Web there is this particular property. The question is, is it only the World Wide Web or there are perhaps other systems who may hold the same property? Well, here's another system. This is the internet. Now, I know that in, in the popular press, the internet and the World Wide Web are very similar animals. They're often used as synonyms of each other. But in reality, the World Wide Web is an informational network, and the internet is a physical network where routers and computers are connected by physical lines. So it's a very, very different architecture, uh, architecturally and the way you built it. And yet, when you look at it, you can kind of see that it has the basic features of the networks that I showed earlier which we actually, in technical terms, we call scale-free networks, that there are a few major hubs and many, many peripheral nodes. And indeed, in 1999, Faluzos, Faluzos, and Faluzos have shown that the topology of this network is, again, follows a power law distribution. And once again, we call networks that have a power law degree distribution scale-free. And if you want to kind of think about what it means to be scale-free, well, it means to have a power law degree distribution. But if you just want to simply go away with thinking, it's really a network that held together by a few major hubs, that many, many small nodes and a hierarchy of large hubs. That would be probably enough to understand everything that I want to say in the future of this talk. So, okay, the networks I showed you so far have a common property. They were all men built. So is this something that we do? For whatever reason, we prefer to build hubs? Or there's something more fundamental, some deeper going on over here? And to answer that question, we have to look at networks that we have not ourselves explicitly built. And those are the networks within our cells. What you see on the left-hand side is the metabolic network of yeast. On the right-hand side is the protein-protein interaction network of yeast. And both of them actually turn out to have the scale-free property if you analyze it. And the best, you can kind of see it very nicely on the right-hand side. There are a few major hubs here, one there, here's down there, one there, and many, many peripheral nodes. And indeed, the analysis actually bones out the scale free nature of this particular network. So if you think about it, this is pretty amazing because the World Wide Web has a history of barely 20 years. The internet, maybe 50 years. Airline network, roughly the same. This has a history of 4 billion years. And yet, over 20 and over 4 billion years, networks in a completely different context, with a different role, have converged to the same underlying architecture. They built up the same mathematical structure, the same ratio, hops, and so on, which is really raising the question, why is that? Why do we have hops? Why do we have this KFE property in such a different networks? And to understand that, we have to go back and ask ourselves, what could be wrong with the erdos and model? That is, what are we missing really from the model? And the answer, it turns out, is that there are two assumptions in the model that turn out to be you know, not borne out in reality. The first is that in the random network model, we assume that we have a fixed number of nodes that we lead, later need to connect with links randomly. The assumption in there is that the number of nodes doesn't change while we're adding the links. In reality, most networks are growing objects. They start from a few nodes and they add new documents, and the web is the best example, new nodes to it. The web is the best example because really it started out with one node 21 years ago and now it has more than a trillion. How did we go from one to a trillion? One node at a time, always adding new web pages to the system. So growth is an inherent property of these networks. And if you want to model the network, you should start out with a small module, you know, the source starting point, and start adding new nodes to it. Now, if you do that, you have to answer the following question. How do I decide where will the new node connect to the existing nodes? 
So, and that one is actually takes us to another assumption in the Erdős and Rényi model, because in the random network model, we assume that we choose randomly the nodes we're to connect to. And in reality, we find that the new nodes have a preference towards the more connected nodes. And this is what we call preferential attachment. And now if you consider these two uh, rules together, you can actually see how a network emerges. And you can see that naturally hubs show up in the system and the mechanism behind the emergence of the hubs is very clear. If a new node comes in the system and has a choice between a highly connected one and the less connected one, because of preferential attachment, it's much more likely to choose the, the more connected one, and therefore the more connected will grow faster than the small one, and not only will maintain its hub status, but will get bigger and bigger. So it's this rich and gets richer phenomenon that is really responsible for the emergence of these power laws or the hubs. And the reason why so many different networks have this K-free property is because they really satisfy the two minimal requirements you need to have a scale-free network. They are the result of some kind of growth process, whether that took over 20 years or 4 billion years to emerge, as well as you know, they, uh, they, they have some degree of preferential attachment. And in the case of, the, uh, of biological networks, we know that gene duplication is the mechanism through which you get this preferential attachment. Now the question is, why do hubs matter? Do we have a simple answer to that? And one of the things we learned in the last decade is that hubs really have a major role once they're in, present in the system. And the best way to look at it is to explore, for example, one aspect of complex networks or complex systems in general, which is their robustness. In general, we perceive complex systems to be very robust against failures. What do I mean by that? That the system can continue many of its basic functions even when some of their components are broken. And the question is, where does this robustness come from? And there are lots of mechanisms, both in the cell and in many other systems, that really check for the health of the nodes, and if something is broken, we fix it, we avoid it, and so on. But the question is really, could the network topology itself contribute to the underlying robustness of the system? And to test that, we can start from a small network and ask a simple question. What happens if some of the nodes break down? Well, what would happen? Well, here I removed three of the nodes, and what you can see is that the network broke into tiny pieces. Now, the question is, what if I do it not for such a tiny network, but for a much larger, much more interconnected network? And it turns out that a field of mathematics and physics, so-called percolation theory, gives us a mathematically very precise answer to this question. And what it tells us is that if you start from a random network or from a regular network, like a score lattice, and if you remove a few nodes, it will not matter because the few nodes will really not threaten the network's integrity. But as you start removing more and more nodes, you will approach a critical point that is inherent to every network and it's calculable. And once you get close to the critical point, the network will actually fall into pieces and you can never get beyond the critical point because you will already broke the network into tiny, tiny components. So essentially what, what percolation theory tells us is that each network has its own intrinsic calculable threshold for robustness and if you try to approach that, the system will break into pieces, will become dysfunctional. It turns out that that property is not valid for scale-free networks. And to indicate it, let me start from the network that I built earlier, and let's start randomly removing the nodes. And what you can see is that the network is shrinking, but doesn't really want to break apart. And you can understand why is that. Let's assume that you start randomly closing down the airports around the United States. Well, which airports would you close? Well, you're probably gonna close many of the small airports because there's so many of them. Your chances of randomly hitting the Chicago airport is very, very tiny. So what you will end up doing is that you will shrink the network, but you will not necessarily destroy it. And indeed, we have now exact mathematical proofs that for a large scale free networks, the critical point at which the network breaks apart is exactly one. What does that mean? It means that you can remove 95% of the nodes and the remaining 5% are still hanging together, talking to each other. But there's a price you pay for that. What if you don't remove the nodes randomly? What if you start with the biggest node and the next biggest node and so on? And then of course, that's what we call an attack. And because the network so deeply relies on the existence of the big hubs and they guarantee its underlying connectivity, if you remove some of the big hubs, the network will break into pieces in no time. So down the line, if you go ahead and compare these two networks on the left and right, you see that 
On the left, we remove 28 nodes and the network is broken, is still integral. On the right, actually, after removal of six or seven nodes, the network was broken into tiny pieces. And this is what we call the Achilles heel of these networks. They are very robust to random failures, but they are very fragile to attacks. If you know how the network looks like, if you have the wiring diagram, you know how to hurt them, you know how to destroy them. Now, coming back to biological systems, the question would come, if hubs are so important for the integrity of the network, could they really be associated with biological function? And to test that, about a decade ago, we took the protein interaction network of yeast, and we asked the question, what happens if you remove small nodes versus big hubs? And you know that was an early data set, and in particular, we started to cor correlate that one with lethality. Do you kill the cell if you remove a small node versus you removing a hub? And what the data indicated that if you remove some of the smaller nodes, about 18% of the one, uh, smaller nodes are lethal. But if you go towards two or more, degree two or more, that is toward more interactions, then 24% was lethal. And if you went to 15 and more, then 62% were lethal. So what this was indicating is that there seemed to be a deep connection between how much of a hub a node is, how interconnected it is, and its role in the network or the cell's ability to survive without it. And indeed, following this, actually, there have been a number of studies to show that hubs evolve slower, that, that they are much more alike in different organisms, and also a work that we did with Mark Vidal a few years ago to show that hub removal has many more phenotypic consequences than removing a small node in case of humans. And that is, of course, not at all surprising because, you know, since the hubs interact with so many components, you know, if you remove them, the chances are that actually you're going to have uh, many more consequences. I'm sorry, in case of yeast, not in humans. Now, this actually suggested the following. If in the yeast, hops tend to be lethal and conserved, then perhaps hum in humans, they should be disease genes. Because you really can't mess with the hops. If you do, then you will probably cause diseases. So we went out to test this. And when the data sets actually became available for human protein interactions, we went out to generate the same plot that you see over here, asking the question, is it true that the more connected the human protein is, the more likely that it will be disease associated? And to our surprise, what we saw is that there was an effect, but there was a very weak effect. No effect would be the horizontal line over here. The yellow dots actually indicate that the more connected the protein was, slightly more likely there was disease associated, but the effect was so weak that we really couldn't claim much based on that. And then we realized, well, if you start thinking about this problem, you really have to think in a different way because humans, as always, things are more complicated and we need to systematically distinguish essential from non-essential disease genes. And what do I mean by that? Essential genes are what we call in utero essential, that is without which the baby could not actually be born. And non-essential disease, uh, disease genes are those whose mutations are somehow associated with a particular known human disease. And there is some overlap between them, but the overlap is not significant. So then the question was, if we do the analysis separately for the essential and the disease genes, would we see some difference? And there was a major difference. What we found is that the essential genes, those without which we could not exist, really correlate very strongly with hubs. But there was no correlation whatsoever when it comes to the disease genes. Disease genes were not hubs. And actually, we dig more into the problem. We looked at expression patterns and, uh, and the tissue uh, 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 expression and so on. And to our surprise, the following image kind of showed up. So from the network perspective, we can actually define two regions in the network. Let's define the center of the network where you see most, where you have most of the hubs. We also have the genes that are expressed in many different tissues that are co-expressed with many other genes. And that's the region in the network where you see the essential genes. And then there is the network periphery, the not so connected nodes, the non-hubs, the genes that are really specific to the tissue that are not expressed with many other genes under most conditions. And those turn out to be most of the disease genes. So, and that one is now, in hindsight, is understandable what has happened here. You know, if you think about the role of evolution, you cannot really survive with a mutation that significantly affects the function of an essential gene. You will not live long enough to pass it on to your children. So what you would expect that many of the heritable diseases would not be affecting the hubs, would not be affecting the center of the network because without that, the network cannot survive and they would not be passed on the population. And therefore, most of the disease genes, the ones that we really focus on, are really at the periphery of the network, uh, not in the center. 
And indeed, if you do another check where you look at the cancer genes, then you find that in that case, the semantic mutations, they tend to be in the center and not at the periphery. Now, the next question that comes up along these lines is that, you know, this is about looking across all the disease genes, but how do the disease genes relate to the diseases themselves? And of course, in here, we don't have the same problem as a typical reader of newspapers has, where we tend, where, where there's this impression that there's one gene, one disease. We know very well that there is actually multiple relationship between diseases and genes. That is, if you pick, you know, a cancer-related gene like BRCA2, that can be linked to multiple cancer types. And the same way, <clears throat> if, you keep, uh, if you pick breast cancer, there could be multiple genes associated with that. In the network language, this is what we call a bipartite network relationship, like the kind of like actors playing movies, so you can connect actors to the movies in which they played with, or you can connect movies through the actors and so on. So, uh, but the bottom line is that you have two different kinds of nodes that connect across to each other. If you have a bipartite network, you can define from that what we call two projections. One is what we call the gene network, where two genes are connected if they're involved in the same disease, and that's a type of network that I will not speak today about. I would like to focus instead on what we call the disease network, where two diseases are linked to each other if the same gene is involved in both of them. Why would you do that? Because if the same gene is involved in both of them, we expect that the two diseases have some common genetic origin, and you know, that may be actually a meaningful relationship. So now, what if you play this game not only for certain cancers, but you play it for all diseases? And that's exactly what we did a few years ago. Um, we ended up uh, getting from the OMIMI data set all the disease and gene associations, and we built up this network, and let me just walk you through that. Each node corresponds to disease, and the number of, the size of the node corresponds to how many genes are were known at that time to be associated with the disease. In this case, we, we took the stringent domain data, which not only that the gene has been associated with that, but we also knew the mutation that is really perhaps potentially associated with the particular phenotype. The, the node's color corresponds to the class of disease. And uh, you know, two diseases once again are linked if there is one or multiple genes that are associated with both of them. And this is what we call the disease-ome that was referred to in the introduction, or the human disease network. And you know, if you step back, there are a number of conclusions you can draw from it right away. First of all, you know, most diseases that we may go different doctors to see are really all connected to each other down at the genetic level because they are all rooted in defects in, this, in a relatively handful of genes. You can also notice that colors of same kind are in the same region of the network, and that's not by design. It naturally came out like that. And that just reflects that similar kind of diseases share lots of genes, and therefore they cluster together in the disease network. And, but the most important thing you can actually ask yourself is that, is this meaningful? That is, if I see a link here between two diseases, should I conclude something that may be meaningful biologically or medically? And in some cases, we know that it's meaningful. For example, if you take that particular link, what is over here, which is by, between diabetes and obesity, we know that not only they share genes, but there's quite a bit of literature that the two diseases are deep related to each other. There are books and journals devoted to that particular link only. But the question is that, does this mean that all these other links may have a similar effect? That in this particular case, what would mean that, could it be that if two diseases are connected genetically, that would also imply comorbidity between them? That is, would the microscopic information that we have at the cellular level amplify itself and pop up actually at the, at the human population level as comorbidity patterns? And to test that, we started taking pairs of diseases, each of those, and started asking, do they share uh, genes? Are there protein interactions between the genes? Are they co-express the genes and so on? But we also turned to the Medicare data and we looked for uh, the disease history for about 10 years for 30 million patients and we ask for the same pair of phenotypes, whether they are comorbid or not. That is, we measure the relative risk between two diseases. The relative risk is one if the two diseases really overlap just by chance. It's larger than one if more individuals would have the same, the two diseases as you would expect by chance, is smaller than one if there is some kind of protective mechanism. If you get one, you don't tend to get the other one. So, so then what we wanted to ask is that, is it true that disease pairs that have this type of relationship, that share genes or have protein interaction networks, between, uh, protein interactions between the components, would be much more likely to be 
comorbid than those that don't have that relationship. And we find that that's indeed the case. So what you should look at is the blue curve, which is the relative risk. And for all diseases, there is some baseline relative risk over there. This is elderly patients. But then when you look at, I'm sorry, when you look at all diseases, that share at least one gene, this is the column, there's a very significant increase in comorbidity. So what is this is really indicating that if you are really linked at the genetic level by sharing genes, that information, which is a microscopic information, gets amplified in the population as comorbidity patterns, which shows again the value of this large patient data for starting asking questions at the microscopic level and relating the two things together. Now the question is what this is suggesting to us is that if we really want to understand comorbidity patterns and many other things, we need to start looking at the microscopic level. We need to start looking at how the components within the cell link to each other. And what you see is actually is the latest protein interaction network a map that uh, Mark Vidal came out, uh, brought from his lab, we call the 20% map, that shows the relationship between the, uh, the known relationship between components. And the challenge, of course, is that, you know, if this is so messy, how do we look at the particular mechanisms? How do we kind of think about local effects within that? And there is one more concept that I need to introduce before we can actually go back to the cell, which is the concept of communities. What is indicated increasingly in network science is that whenever you see a large network like that, there are well-defined local agglomeration within the network. These are a group of people who tend to know each other because they're in the same department or the same family or they go to the same club. These are proteins or genes that interact with each other because they are responsible for the same function. And what has happened during the five years is that identifying these regions is really what we call an NP-complete problem, but then lots of new algorithms have really popped up that allow us to identify these locally dense regions in the network. And what do I mean by that? This is, for example, a very small region of a mobile phone call network where the nodes are the mobile phone numbers and the links who is calling whom. And you see it's messy. And this has only a few thousand nodes out of a 10 million database that we've been studying for the last uh, uh, seven years. And imagine if I were to draw all of it. It's completely impossible to make sense of it. But by using some of these algorithms, we can actually go into any neighborhood and identify where are the modules there. That is, we can zoom in and replace this big mess with local neighborhoods claiming that these genes belong to, these nodes belong to the same neighborhood, and so are these, and so are these. And the technically, the definition of a community is that nodes within that community have more links to nodes within the same community than nodes outside of the community. So there's a local agglomeration there. Now, we have the tools to find the communities. The question is, do they matter? We will often call them modules within the network. And in the case of the mobile phone network, we can check if these modules are meaningful. And the way we can check is because we know who is calling whom and when they call. So that's what I'm going to show you is the same network now, but two projections of it, exactly the same network, but I added one more information that I have not used before, which is how many calls the two people made during a certain hour of the day with each other. So if it's red, they called a lot, let's say, at midnight. If it's yellow, they didn't talk much at midnight. And if it's white, there was no discussion whatsoever at midnight between them. And now you see the same module shown at midnight and at noon, and you see fundamental differences between them. You see that this particular module is sleeping at noon, but very busy at midnight. And the other module is the opposite, sleeping at midnight and busy at noon. One is important here is that the activity matter is, seems to be very limited to the particular community. So people in the same community seem to be behaving at the same time in the same way which indicates that these modules that we are finding only from the network topology are really meaningful when it comes to the function of the particular system. So with that baggage and with the tools in hand, let's go back to biological systems and start looking at biological networks and how this is actually playing out. And I'm gonna use yet another level of extractions to really understand that. Let's, let's use a network that we are all familiar with to put these pieces together. And the network that we are all familiar with would be the map of Manhattan. And let's you know, join me for a minute in believing that this is not a city map, but this is really the map of the cell, where the intersections are the, no, the proteins and the road segments correspond to the interactions between them. Now, what does it mean to have modularity in the network? Well, if you go to Manhattan and you wanna to go to theater, you don't just go anywhere in the Manhattan, but you go to the theater district, to Broadway, because most of the theaters are concentrated in one particular neighborhood. 
should you want to buy an artwork. You once again don't wander randomly, but you go in the neighborhood of the 21st Street, because that's where most of the major galleries are. That's where you find easily quality art. So down the line, if you look carefully, you realize that in most major cities, in Manhattan, bearing a very good example, many functions are very compartmentalized. They have very well-defined regions in the network where that is happening. So if this were to be a map of the cell, what would that mean? It would mean that not only function, but the breakdown of the function would be compartmentalized. And if that is true, then for example, taking this analogy further, we could say that cancer is somewhere on Wall Street. And <laughs> bipolar disorder would be in Manhattan, or somewhere in the Times Square neighborhood. And you could put asthma somewhere next to the Washington Bridge, where New York breeds much of its mess into New Jersey and, uh, uh, and the Bronx. So the idea is that really we should be able to identify these neighborhoods by looking at the network and where the functions are and the breakdown of the functions, how they correspond to the, uh, the particular neighborhood. So if you take this picture further, what does it mean to have a disease? Well, think of a very well-known Manhattan phenotype, which is called a traffic jam. Now, there are many different ways you can actually cause a traffic jam. But down the line, what you're doing is that you are, you're creating a dysfunction by closing down different combinations of streets, and the phenotype will be the same, you know, that there is no traffic in the city. So in a way, this is very analogous to what we see in cancer, like Bert Wogenstein's finding that, you know, when you look at uh, colorectal cancer patients, their mutations are in very different type of genes, within a certain group of genes, but they're really different combinations. The way to think about it is that it's not the gene, but the function that you are destroying, and the module carries the function, and you know, you, there are many different ways you can actually disabilitate that particular module and achieve essentially the same phenotype. So if, the, if that analogy is correct, then it's easy what we need to do next. Get a map, find a disease module, and drug it, and we're done. But of course, by now you realize that there is a catch in this whole thing. We don't really have a map. And let's not go into why we don't have a map, but let's talk about what are the consequences of not having a map. One of the areas that I worked very closely with Mark Vidal is protein interaction networks. And we helped him actually develop a methodology by we can explicitly estimate how many links we are missing from the protein interaction networks that we currently have, and how much effort would it be actually to get the full one. So we have a whole roadmap to have to achieve that. And what we know is that currently the protein interaction maps that we have represent about 20% of the links that should be there in the cell at least discoverable with the current techniques. Now, what does it mean to have only 20%? Well, having 20%, it means that we're missing 80%. So let's see what happens if I remove 80% of the road segments in Manhattan. And what you see is that Manhattan will become actually effectively unrecognizable. But this is the type of accuracy and completeness that we're really dealing with when it comes to the cell. Of course, the cell is a bit denser than what we have in Manhattan, so it would not so break so drastically apart. But down the line, you know, by missing 80% of the links, you know, we are really looking at a very fragmented picture of reality. So then the question is, what can we do? Or we should just simply wait for Mark and many others to really go, go and get us better maps and then restart our thinking about that. And the answer is no, because what I believe, and actually there's lots of evidence for that, that the existing maps are already very predictive. So what we can do while we're waiting for Mark to finish his work is really to you know, use the predictive power of the existing links and the existing maps to learn about diseases. So what I'm going to show you next is that how we do that, how we go through that particular program very briefly in case of asthma or in general in under any other diseases. So the idea is that the overall roadmap is shown over here. The first goal is to build as an ac accurate and as complete map as we can based on the current interactions, and this is really just a, a, a literature and the many other data curation, the type of thing that NCBI does wonderfully here at NIH as well. The second is to take the known disease components, let's say the asthma genes that we know about, on the network, and identify where is the potential module, to what degree this is concentrated in a certain neighborhood. Once you have that module, to use whether the other genes in the neighborhood of that module that would potentially be relevant to the particular disease, and eventually to identify pathways and correlate with biological information to lead you all the way to, uh, uh, to target prediction and so on, and mechanism prediction. 
Now, the catch is that if you try to do that for any disease, you will encounter the following situation. So we took about 140 genes that were in the literature associated with asthma with some stringency, and we put them in this wall network that I was showing you earlier, and what we realized is of the 140 genes, only 37 actually formed or are connected to each other. The rest were all over the map. Now, of course, that shouldn't surprise us any longer they're all over the map because we're missing 80% of the interactions or even more. So therefore, you know, th th they could actually be part of the map, except that we, we don't know whom they interact with to actually connect it up. But, and this is important, the 37, even though it seems to be small, it is not small at all. It is very highly significant because if you were to throw the same number of genes randomly on this map, you would only expect about four or five genes to connect in a single cluster. So the fact that we have 37, that is telling us that we are seeing actually the location where potentially the asthma module should be actually within the map. So let me just illustrate this one, how it looks like. So this is the full network, and I highlighted on the full network now the asthma genes. And you can see that some of them seem to be scattered, some of them seem to be roughly in the same neighborhood, and we think that that neighborhood that is delineated by these asthma genes would correspond to what we would call an asthma module. And there are probably many other genes who belong to that that have not been yet validated or have been discovered. But we can use this network information to try to discover them. And the way we do that is that we start from these genes and we ask, let's look at the neighborhood of these, uh, of these proteins. And let's find those that connect with lots of them because they're potentially related to the same disease. And to achieve that, we develop different uh, algorithms. The basic idea of the algorithm is that if this is your asthma module, if you have a protein that connects to only two asthma uh, proteins, and you have another one that connects to asthma proteins and a bunch of other ones, this is much more likely to be asthma-related than that one because this may have these three interactions only thanks to its promiscuity and not because it's specific to asthma. So through that procedure, you can actually go ahead and fill out the neighborhood of the, of the proto-module that we see already in the network. And if you do that, this is roughly what you're actually going to see for the, uh, happening in front of your eyes. We are effectively filling in the module. You know, we're finding the neighborhood of the genes that may be a disease associated. And some of the other genes that were disease associated now actually gets up connected up as well because you put in genes in between who now link them up. So now we have a hypothetical disease module. The question is, is this relevant really to asthma? Or, uh, and the way to test it is that we start looking to all the different kind of data that is available to us, from gene expression data to epigenetic data to GWAS data, simply asking the new genes that we added to the module, do they show relevance to asthma compared to the seed genes that we started from, which are the, the experimental established asthma-related genes? And generally we find that, that there are typically in the same neighborhood regarding their relevance to asthma. They show roughly the same expression pattern. They roughly show, show the same GVAS relevance and, and, on, and so on. So this is the evidence, but I'm not going to go through in detail to so that. But down the line, what we find is that indeed those genes that are in the neighborhood of the asthma protomodule, many of them are show biologically are indistinguishable regarding the high throughput data in their signature from the existing asthma genes. <laughs> Not only we find that, but we also find that when we treat with drugs the patients with asthma or no asthma, then, and this is what I'm showing here, this is actually the asthma module that we identified, the one that was so nicely in purple earlier, and then uh, we actually treated both normal cells as well as asthmatic cell lines, uh, fibroblast cell lines with glucocortisone, and then we asked the question, where would the expression patterns emerge, inside the module or outside of the module? And what we find is that the effect of glucocortisone is very significantly localized within the module. You know, the Z number is about six or so, both in healthy as well as in uh, asthma patients, which means that really glucocortisone is really hitting some regions of the map. But not only that, but it's really hitting certain very well-defined regions of that. And this may actually give us some hit about both the effectiveness of certain drugs as well as population heterogeneity regarding the response to the drugs because the way you would think about uh, the response pattern is that this is the disease module. If we are right approximately, then the breakdown of this module many different ways could lead to the same phenotype. And there are different regions you can break down. And if your drug happens to be uh, disturbing the same region where you actually have the, the problem, 
then you may respond to that. If it's a different region, you may not. So this is kind of a way to zoom your attention into a certain neighborhood, into a sub certain subnetwork, and understand the behavior of the system through that, and really uh, focus your resources there. So what does this all mean? Well, what this all means is that at the end, I tend to think that if you want to think what is the future of medicine, and if you're willing to accept any word from a physicist like myself who's not a medical doctor, is that we're going to have to learn in terms of this network. We're going to have to learn that diseases are well localized in certain regions of this network. And I can imagine a time, not too, not too much into the future, where the, if you remember about 10, 20 years ago, in most biochemistry labs, there was a boring and high map of metabolic pathways essentially on the wall. We would have some kind of representation of the full cellular network and the different diseases marked here. This is where cancer is residing. This is where asthma is residing, which is where other diseases are residing. And I think it's fully doable because all the data that we have access to indicates that the disease genes are clustered in well-defined neighborhoods of the network. And the disease, and we don't see them all in one, one neighborhood, is because the networks are very incomplete. It also means that you know, diseases, if this is true, then diseases that are alike should be close to each other. And we see evidence of that. So we started looking at COPD as well, which has many similar symptoms to asthma. So the yellow notes will be the COPD module that we uncovered, the purple are the asthma. And you can see clearly that they're in the same neighborhood. And not surprising at all, we would think that diseases who have very similar characteristics should be somehow residing in the same neighborhood. And one of the things we're doing in the lab is that we really believe that measuring the distance between diseases in these existing maps already should give us a very precise measure of how similar or different they are from each other that should correlate with many characteristics from gene expression patterns all the way to symptoms, uh, all the way to comorbidity patterns. We think this is the distance that really matters, how far you are in the network. Uh, uh, and the current available methods that we have actually are really just a poor man's approximation towards that. So given that, let me switch gears and ask the question, do these networks matter and can we show really how they actually uh, work? And one, one little study that we did in this direction is to look at not at the molecular network because everything that I showed you there was at the molecular level. All the links were physical links, the one that you would deal with in the lab. But to look at the comorbidity map, simply use the Medicare data and simply ask to what degree two diseases are comorbid. So in this map, what you see actually is that two nodes are connected if they show a statistically significant comorbidity between them. And if you, if you look at the map, you can see very clear, interesting patterns coming up. You see many of the chronic diseases are in one cluster and cancer are all in a diff completely different universe, almost disconnected from that. So this is kind of highlighting that really we're dealing with a very different disease, you know, uh, because their really comorbidity patterns is fundamentally different. But most important, we can ask this question, should you have a choice? Which disease would you want to have? Would you want to be in somewhere in the center of the network to get lots of attention? Or would you want to be in the periphery that nobody really has uh, studied much about? And the data indicates that you would prefer to be in the periphery. And the way we did that is that we simply look at the degree of each node, that how many links they have to other diseases, how much the comorbidity, and then we looked what's your rate of uh, survival after age uh, eight years or the likelihood of not survival. And what you see is that the more connected the disease is, the, oops, the less likely that you will actually be surviving after eight years. So, and that of course makes lots of sense. If you're getting one of the central diseases, that will probably trigger a wall comorbidity patterns towards it. It will trigger actually a systemic breakdown and, and then will probably you know, uh, end the story there. So coming back to this, you know, what in the summary what I would like to say is that I personally am a big believer that we need to kind of refocus our attention to this full network. This network is very incomplete, but we can get there to make it more complete. It requires resources. I'm not the person to make it complete. This is really fundamental and experimental work. But if we will get it complete or we'll get it closer to completion, it could have just as much power in our, could provide as much power in our hands as the genome uh, uh, project has provided us. I also believe that there may be a time actually when, when you go to the doctor, he will show you let me tell you why is a problem that you have that particular mutation that whatever sequencing project told you. Because that mutation is in this part of the network. And these are the pathways and the diseases in that particular neighborhood. 
And that's the reason why you have to watch out whatever that, uh, and this is, the, this is the measures you have to take because that particular neighborhood affects, uh, is correlated with particular diseases. So, you know, I, I also believe that we have a responsibility to really rethink everything about disease as well as disease classification from the perspective that really matters, that is the wiring diagram of the cell. I'm not saying that we should stop, uh, we, sh we should stop treating cardiologists and neurologists, but we should certainly make each of our doctors a bit of a networkologist as well. So, so then the question is, what is, net, you know, what is network medicine, which was my title? And you know, do we have a chance to really go down this path? And I'm very encouraged by the fact that while, you know, let's say five years ago or 10 years ago, much of this thinking about molecular networks was really delegated to a small group of molecular biologists. In the last few years, medical doctors have really taken up the flag and they really propagate for that we need to develop a network understanding of disease. A good illustration of that is the fact that Harvard is in the process, actually it's already started, a new division, the division of network medicine that is hiring very heavily new faculty as well as new staff to really develop a network thinking of diseases from the molecular level all the way to how it affects the doctor in, in their day-to-day uh, -day, uh, uh, practice. So how do we get there? How do we really make this useful? Well. The traditional thinking is that we have diseases, which is this middle layer. We have diseases, they somehow connect to each other by comorbidity. And by now, nobody's surprised by the fact that there is actually an underlying network that affects that, that determines that. But what is the relationship between them is really the big question of all of us. And, and I think we really need to make that relationship very clear and very predictable and very useful. But also will not be enough to stay at the molecular level. We know very well how important the environmental effects are. So we need to systematically start exploring a yet a higher layer, which is you know, the environmental effects. You know, a, a good example study is Nicholas Christakis' work to show that social networks, for example, also affect the, the chance of uh, uh, obesity. But that's not only about the social networks. It's like we, we should be able to encode the environment, environmental effects and build into the picture to see how it actually affects the, the diseases as well as the molecular processes down the line. So if we succeed, you know, how, coming back to the first analogy that I showed in the talk, how can we make the doctor as efficient as the mechanic? And the parts list is already there. You know, the genomics has provided to us. Network medicine aims to provide the blueprint, the one that the mechanic has its in hand to see how the pieces fit together. But to use that, we also have di need to have diagnostic tools, and there's lots of efforts in this direction. And eventually, we're gonna to have to do what the mechanic does to replace the parts. And of course, there are guesses how to get there, but we need to build up this, all this vertical uh, uh, process in order to be just as effective as a mechanic could be with our car. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Francis. Good to see you. Sorry that I arrived a little late, but I uh, soaked up a good deal of that wonderful presentation, and we have time for some questions. So yes, please. So I'm Bert Gold. Um, Laszlo, as you were speaking, I was uh, remembering a wonderful talk that actually Francis was there for, uh, that Jerry Fink gave in defense of Eric Lander uh, and the uh, black matter that's hidden in the genome in relation to GWASs. And in those experiments, what Jerry did was to make oxytrophic le lethal mutants and then show on different backgrounds of yeast mm -hmm. uh, that those were no longer lethals. Mm -hmm. And so my question really has to do with the robustness of your model. Mm -hmm. And um, in particular, I would make the New York analogy, which is, um, so I need some artwork, and I go to Chelsea, and I can't get through to over to that side, and uh, the, it's all blocked down towards Soho, but it happens that I know that there are a couple of galleries up on the Upper West Side, mm -hmm. and so I can get my artwork up there. Mm -hmm. So how much? really is this gray mm -hmm. sort of in-between stuff. Yes, I mean, of course, there's lots of gray areas of dark matter actually within the cell. Let's start talking about RNAs and lots of other interactions that I haven't even not touched before because we don't have systematic maps. 
Regarding your analogy, I think if you really want to buy an artwork, you would go next day to the 21st Street, <laughs> given the amount of investment you would have to do for that. But I really think that this question can be addressed, and there are examples where we have addressed it. And that example, for example, is the metabolic network, where we ourselves, I was involved in a set of experiments with Zotan Otway, where we did lethality under many different conditions for E. coli, and you find a different set of genes to be essential in that case. And then you look at the metabolic network, and then you realize that indeed, in the different conditions, different set of enzymes are necessary to, pr pr to produce the biomass. So if you want to go back to the New York uh, uh, analogy, New York, Wall Street is very busy during the day, dead during night, you know. And if you somehow mess during the night with Wall Street, you will not have such an impact as missing during the day, you know, hence 9-11 <laughs> happened during the day. So in a way or the other, you know, if you start looking at environmental differences, if you start looking at temporal aspects and so on, you should be able to account for those variations that you were mentioning. But dark matter wise, there's lots there. It's just that your measures of the robustness, I think, need to be better developed so, yes. so as to give us an idea of how precise the map needs to be. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Over here. Thank you, Dr. Barabasi. It's Bell Waring with the NIH Record. The last 10 years or so, what would you say in the work that you've done, what has surprised you the most? Mm -hmm. Oh. Actually, a <laughs> number of things. One of them is the dark matter, actually. The dark that, matter? The dark matter, what we're referring to in the sense that, that there's lots of interactions that were not in the radar screen before us, like the role, role of RNAs and other things. And they're still not there in the sense that we don't have systematic maps as we have for protein interactions and so on to really assess their importance. Uh, it also, uh, I was also surprised by the universality of the network structures that we see across different organisms. Uh, you know. We had 10 years ago lots of big arguments with Zoltan Otwa, my collaborator, the biologist, whether these networks would be like the World Wide Web or the Internet. And, you know, until we made the measurements, we had no clue. Mm -hmm. And you could really argue both ways <laughs> why because evolution and optimization would make these biological networks very different from a World Wide Web. And yet they turn out to be very similar. Mm -hmm. So, and is this universality, I think, that helped us to build a community in thinking about networks that is truly interdisciplinary because we realize that our problems are very common. The computer scientists who work on networks struggle with very similar problems and they need very similar tools as the biologist who wants to actually predict lethality. So is this dark matter, is this a cousin of the term that, that physicists, astrophysicists use? It's a term that astrophysicists, I'm using as a metaphor to say that there's lots of interactions okay. that we may not even know that they do exist. Not because, you know, and here I particularly refer to type of interactions that we don't even know that such an interaction is possible. Uh -huh. You know, like the RNA, or role of RNA is one of those examples. Okay, that's interesting. Thank you. Okay. Uh, hi, uh, thanks for that and very interesting talk. Um, I have a question regarding the disease network that you showed where you connect the disease where uh, they have common genes. Um, I mean, logically, it makes sense that, you know, the diseases that have common phenotype would most likely have common genes. Mm -hmm. But I would like to ask that, did you, um, is there any selection bias that you came across? For example, you know, a certain type of cancer studies, uh, certain uh, genes that you already know are associated with certain types, you'd study them more for different types of cancers. And if you de did see these type of biases, how did you deal with them mm -hmm. when constructing these networks? Oh, absolutely. There is lots of selection bias. There are selection bias in the way that literature-based networks are built because, you know, people focus lots of attention to diseases of their favor favorite diseases. A joke that is going in the community, if you need to get a cancer grant, you've got to connect your gene to P53. You've got to find the link to that. <laughs> you know, may not be true, but, but, but effectively, there's not surprising perhaps that P53 set so many links. Is that biologically really true? Not that it doesn't have, but could it be that lots of other genes have that many links as well, except we haven't really focused so much on them, so therefore we don't have that. So there is that one. There is also, of course, the selection bias regarding the diseases that we look at. The, the, the frequently studied, the very prevalent diseases obviously are much more explored. We know much more mutations and diseases associated and so on. Rare diseases, much less so with some exceptions. So they're there. How do you deal with that? Well, it depends always on the question. There is no generic answer. So, so when you try to address a particular question, whether it's a disease associated question or a general network property, you need to start asking how you falsify uh, your hypothesis. For example, one way you can falsify your hypothesis is to say, 
I'm not going to use literature, well, I'm going to use literature data as well, but I will try to check my conclusions on high throughput data that were collected under the similar circumstances, whether it's coming from mass spec or, uh, or yeast to hybrid, and see whether the effect is there as well. You know? and, and so for each of the questions that you need to ask, you need to think, do I, can I build a control that would really put me at rest that the effect that we're seeing actually is generic? And to be honest, I would say, you know, four out of five effects that we see in the lab are tossed out at that moment, you know, because they, they just don't stand up. It seems to be a literature bias or something like that going on. Very disappointing, but hopefully you find the fifth one that is really great and you publish it and you're fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> Two more questions. Yes. Thank you, Les. I'm John Pepper from National Cancer Institute. Because a lot of our toughest medical problems involve chronic inflammation, it's very natural that you chose as illustration two inflammatory diseases. It was a little bit difficult to interpret the results because they were also both lung diseases. So I'm curious whether you have even preliminary results on any other inflammatory diseases of other organ systems, say an inflammatory bowel disease or some one of the others. Yes, so uh, we actually have a project that started a bit less than a year ago uh, uh, that was called so-called MapGen project uh, uh, funded by NIH where we're exactly supposed to look at uh, some of the sub inflammatory associated sub, uh, sub phenotypes, so thrombosis and inflammation, and we're attempting to build essentially a disease network that could be associated with, uh, uh, with inflammation the same way we did for asthma. We do have, we are through the, the seed gene selection process, we work with a number of patient data sets to validate ourselves. Uh, you know, we had a meeting actually today, I had to miss it because I was here about that. And so it's ongoing. There's not much I can report other than that we're, that we're working on it and I'm hoping that, you know, within six months to a year we're going to have a paper as well. Great. Thank you. Last question. Okay. Very quick one. Thanks for the great talk. Um, so in your talk you sort of uh, presented the network as a fairly static entity. Mm -hmm. um, but as you know, um, so a lot of the interactions could be conditional on lots of other variables. So going forward, what's your thought on how do we encode that or how should we go about it? So experimentally, we, we, we cannot measure everything under every single yes. condition. Yes, I mean, it's really data dependent. So one of the plans we're actually doing right now is uh, we want to simply use gene expression data for different tissues and restrict the network to tissue specific networks and to see whether, for example, the disease just associated with a particular disease that is not in that tissue will fall out and, and so on. So that's one of the things that we are planning immediately. As dynamical effects, you know, like cell cycle effects and things like that, we'll have to have data actually, and for humans that's kind of harder to get. But the closest we can get to that is really look at different tissues. This network that I show, we think of it as being the skeleton, which would be like kind of the Manhattan map, all the roads that are there. It doesn't mean that there's anybody walking or driving on those streets at a given moment. So if you were to take a snapshot of the traffic, you know, at any moment, certain parts of Manhattan would be deserted, another one would be busy. That's what the, cell, the, uh, the tissue specificity would probably give us. And there may be temporal effects as well. So right now we're approaching that through the tissues. And I think that we're really optimistic that that should be fruitful in that way. We standardly do that restriction to the tissues actually for specific projects, but we'd like to make it in a bigger systematic project. Well, if you'd like to extend your own personal network in the library, that is an available option. Uh, please join me in thanking our speaker again for a presentation that's quite inspiring.